Hi, this is Matthew uh, Robert Payne. I'm a prophet, and uh, this is part two of our interview with Sadhu, Sadhu Sundar Singh, who died in the 1940s, I think, he lived from the 1800s. Uh, he walked in miracle signs and wonders, but he walked away from healing people, and uh, he decided that he was just going to preach Jesus. Is a uh, uh, Indian holy man who dressed in in uh, sarong uh, that uh, showed he that he was a holy man, and he lived uh, like Jesus with no money in his money belt, uh, with one change of clothes and a blanket, walking barefoot around India ministering to people. So, if you haven't seen part uh, one, I'd encourage you to go and watch part one. So we're going to continue with question 16 to 30 in this interview. Then we're going to have uh, part three. So um, so Sadhu is here. He's in a good mood. He's really happy. Uh, uh, part one, if you've watched part one, it was pretty serious and really tough. And Tulu uh, gave me some feedback that it was the toughest most heaviest duty fire breathing uh, interview that we've ever done. And uh, so I'm hoping uh, we can uh, get a more um, loving and graceful uh, sadhu this time with these questions. But, you know, truth hurts, doesn't it? And, uh, you know, um, there's a song that says that, you know, it's only our friends that hurt us the most are the first Cut is the deepest is a song. I'm reminded of that. Sometimes we need the rotten material cut out of us and uh, we feel better after it's cut out. So um, so to, uh, Sadhu's here and Sadhu says, hi, Tulu, how are you? I'm good. How are you as well? I'm really good. I'm in a good mood and ready to answer the rest of the question. Thank you, Sadhu. I think my first question is, why did you find joy in suffering for Christ? Why did you find so much joy? Because a lot of times when you were being beaten, you you were being wounded because the message that you were bringing to people in India and that they were not willing to accept, you were always so joyful for going through those sufferings. Why um, was that? You have to ask... Uh, you've got access to the Apostle Peter. You've got access uh, to the Apostle Paul uh, through uh, your um, uh, being seated in heavenly places. People uh, should have access to these saints. The Apostle Paul, Matthew thinks, wrote that, uh, uh, said that he wanted uh, to share in the fellowship of the sufferings of Christ and you, you know, uh, if if you've been sexually abused or molested by a person or raped by a person, you have a special empathy for someone who's been raped or someone's been molested. There's really nothing worse than you can say to a person, trying to comfort a person by saying, I know how, how you feel, when you don't know how they feel, right? And you haven't been through that and you haven't experienced that. So fellowshipping in the sufferings of Christ is going through the similar life of Christ and suffering like Christ did. Christ um, didn't have any close people to talk to besides Mary Magdalene. His own disciples, he told them, you know, it's mentioned about three times in the gospel, but he told them about five or ten times that he's going to be crucified. Don't set him up as a king stop thinking that i'm going to rule and take over israel i'm going to be crucified i'm going to die and on the third day i'm going to rise the dead and they couldn't understand it these these were meant to be his closest friends and they couldn't understand jesus was seated in heavenly places and coming from enough of realm and and his information was too profound they had a misunderstanding of what was going to happen. The Israelites and all the scholars and all the teachers in Israel thought there was a Messiah 
part one and Messiah was going to conquer and be the king and set up a new kingdom that they couldn't see in scripture. And it's not until you see in hindsight and in scripture, it's not until you understand Jesus has been crucified that you can find a passages in psalm 22 and isaiah 63 53 and other passages that say jesus was going to be crucified so their theology uh, thought that when the messiah was recognized he'd set up his kingdom and rule and reign and take all the enemies away and isaac isaiah 60 the glory of the nations and the wealth of the nations would come to israel uh the the serpent would lie down with the child. Um, it'd be a, a, a country of milk and honey. Uh, uh, God would, uh, Jesus would rule with an iron fist. War would stop. The whole of the world would have to worship in Israel once a year or they wouldn't get rains. They'd have famines. All the prophecies of the millennial reign and all the prophecies of good prophecies of the Messiah millennial reign they thought it was all going to happen in the first visit. They had no idea that there was a Messiah part one, Messiah part two. Jesus, even though they call him the Messiah, he hasn't really done the Messiah prophecies. They call him the Messiah, but he really hasn't been the Messiah. It's like a misnoma. It's like a wrong thing to call him. You call him king of kings, yeah, possibly, but Messiah, he hasn't fulfilled those prophecies. So you can only really understand loneliness if you've been lonely. And, you know, um, the apostle uh, 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 Solomon says, with much wisdom comes much sorrow. And uh, the problem with uh, having supernatural wisdom is not many people can understand that you're realm and it makes you desperately lonely. When you understand, when you really understand who runs this world and who profits and you have understanding of how the world works, like um, uh, it used to be really popular to sell drugs and drugs is a really good way of making money but they've learned that uh, trafficking women and trafficking children is a whole lot more profitable. You can sell uh, cocaine. Uh, Matthew doesn't know prices. Perhaps, you know, a certain measure of cocaine is $60. Uh, you may be able to purchase that for $30 and sell it for $60. You make a $30 profit. You've got to get uh, that shipped. You've got to get it grown, processed, stored, sent, sold and distributed through an illegal network to make $30 at the end. But you can traffic a girl, you can promise a girl that she can be a maid in America, you can fly her over, steal her passports, put her in a room, lock her away and bring her out to a bar and make her sleep with 20 men a night and make $100 each time she sleeps with them and she can make you $2,000 a night. Instead of selling a bag of cocaine for $30, you can uh, do a crime and get $2,000 a night. And with cocaine, you can only sell it once. People use it once. It's not reusable. But with a woman, you can sell hundreds and thousands of times. So trafficking women, children being trafficked, that's why uh, the border is open uh, and, and the southern border is open because they're killing the children and they're using uh, children for pedophiles and trafficking children and selling children. Uh, that's why it's so profitable uh, to traffic children and traffic women uh, in prostitution and abuse because it's so profitable. Well, when you know the world operates like that, when you know that um, Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, drinks the blood of, of young children and uh, threatens and abuses children uh, to have them terrified. And when their adrenaline is going off because they're terrified, they're killed, and you drink the adrenaline and it gives you a special high like a drug. When you find out there's special, there's people in America who are addicted to adrenaline, which is uh, having a young child being uh, scared, uh, scared 
uh, out of their wits and then killed and they're drowning and being a drunk. When you find out and you know the elite do that, when you know that children get sold to pedophiles, pedophiles get sick of them after a year when they stop being fearful and crying and the pedophiles get off on 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 the fear and the screaming and they don't get turned on anymore when when uh, the guys, the young boy is just resolved to, oh, I'm going to get raped again and there's no fear left. They get rid of them and get another new one that gets fear. Uh, when you understand things like that, and you have that wisdom, it brings massive sadness. It brings ma massive suffering. So Jesus understood the suffering that Israel was going through because of the religion of the Pharisees. Uh, Jesus knew so many people could be set free from their sins if they just understood him and understood his love, understood his father, and uh, wanted uh, to be free and were out of religion. And Jesus said, you Pharisees, you load these people down with heavy weights, uh, with their shame and condemnation and their rule keeping, um, that Jesus used to look around and for every person he healed, there was another thousand people that he didn't heal. That really upset him. But unless you know Jesus, you don't know that Jesus suffered in that way, that it was really painful for him to live because for every person he healed, there was another thousand people in another country that hadn't come to him that weren't healed. He may heal a multitude of, uh, you know, 5,000 people, uh, but there's another million people in Israel and there's another half a million of uh, 200,000 of them that haven't been healed. For every uh, sermon he did, it was only the amount of people hearing that sermon that he could break the religion off people and set them free. But for every person that was gathered, there was millions of people that weren't hearing the truth. So they weren't getting the truth that was contrasted to the religion of the Pharisees. They weren't getting the truth. They weren't being healed. They weren't understanding. So his own uh, disciples didn't even uh, understand the fundamental truth that he was going to be killed. And so when you walk in massive wisdom and you're talking to the Holy Spirit and you understand things, you suffer like Jesus. When you see the poor people of India and you walk around and everyone's diseased and everyone's got sickness, you you suffer like Jesus that you can't heal people. You know, uh, there's sick people in every village, but you can't make it to every village. You know, uh, there's so much religion and so, so much enforced uh, Indian gods are being taught as so false but you can't reach it to every village. You can't share it with everyone. You may go to 100 villages in three months, but there's another 10,000 villages you haven't been to, and you suffer because of that. It breaks your heart that you can't get on national TV and broadcast to every Indian and give a message to every Indian and set them all free from the gods. It breaks your heart that you can't, minister to a million people and set everyone free that's full of sickness it breaks your heart that uh that the people in the church in india that's meant to be representing christ don't understand jesus don't know jesus don't walk in what jesus taught they teach another bondage of religion people come out of a false god and fall into uh religion that keeps them in bondage and there's really no Christian that's free of sin. Most Christians don't even believe in the West that you can be free of sin. But 1 John 2, 6 says, He that abides in Christ must walk just like him. And so it's, it's true. And the Apostle Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And uh, the Apostle Peter said, uh, put on righteousness and, and be holy just as the Lord is holy. Peter wouldn't tell you to do something that's not possible. Uh, the Apostle Paul wouldn't say, 
uh, that imitate me as I imitate Christ. If he wasn't imitating Christ, the apostle John wouldn't say if you're abiding Christ, you you must. He who says he abides in Christ must walk just as he is. You, you know, the Christian church say so much and know half a verse the truth shall set you free but they don't know the context of the verse if you abide in my word then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free they they leave that part out of the verse they don't know that that verse before it gives that other verse context so the whole christian church in the west if you're listening to this or reading this the whole Christian church thinks Christian is the way to freedom, the way to truth. And because mm -hmm. they're Christian, they know the truth and they're free. But they're in bondage because abiding in my word is understanding what the 54 parables of Jesus means, understanding what the 50 commandments of Jesus means, and walking in that and obeying that and taking every thought captive according to that. And if you do that, and you take every thought captive according to those teachings, you can make all the right decisions, walk in the spirit, be led by the spirit and overcome the flesh, and you can walk in freedom and you can be demonstrate the character of Jesus and you can become like him. And John says, anyone who says they're abiding in Jesus, which is obeying everything he taught, anyone who's obeying everything Jesus taught, must walk just like him. And it breaks your heart that not only the Hindu faith, not only the Indian faith and their natural gods has got them in darkness, but you look at the church and and they're teaching error and bondage and religion too, and they think they're free, but they can't be like Jesus and not obeying Jesus. You're the only person obeying Jesus, and they reject you. You're meant to be their brother. You go in and talk to them, and they reject you, and they want to throw stones at you and attack you. I, I can say the Christians uh, didn't hurt me with stones and sticks, but they hurt me with their words and people I looked up to, people I wanted to befriend, broke my heart. And what's worse, a bang over the head with a stick or someone saying you're a false prophet, you're from the devil. Um, what gets at you and eats at you at night? You're a false prophet, you're from the devil. Getting called that from a bishop or archbishop of a Catholic church, uh, someone with massive power and massive reputation, you're evil, you're from the devil. The devil plays that in your mind in your weakest moments. So there's all different ways to suffer. And I can tell you that, you know, uh, a couple of disciples, Matthew doesn't remember who, were whipped and thrown in a prison and they started praising God. Uh, and and the angel, uh, something happened in the prison and they walked out of the prison. Uh, all the prisoners were listening to him, praising God. And then the doors opened and everyone got out of the prison. But that just had 39 lashes on their back. That's really painful. Uh, Matthew saw uh, the lashes on Jesus' uh, back one day in a vision and Matthew swears that modern science couldn't have saved Jesus' life. There, there's so much blood. He's, you know, when you dice meat, I'll explain it to you. When you dice meat, you cut strips of meat, and then you turn the knife 90 degrees and you cut cubes of meat. Well, Jesus' back was like striped, like cut stripes of meat. You, you, you cut those lashes of meat. First of all, before you make him in a cube, that's how Jesus was back. It was it it, it says in in one of uh, the prophets that they'll plow they'll, they'll make furrows in my back like a plow, and uh, Jesus' back was whipped to shreds, and uh, thirty nine lashings in those days was really painful. But they were praising God; they they were overcome with joy. So. If I had the choice, uh, honestly, it, it uh, may answer uh, your question, but honestly, if I had the choice between uh, emotional pain and physical pain, I'd choose physical pain every time.
Thank you. Sorry, I'm just moving my where I'm sitting. Okay. Thank you, Sadhu. So my next question is, why did you decide not to wear shoes in your journey? Um, do you know uh, certain Catholics have a belief that uh, that they need to suffer uh, some sort of pain to attain righteousness? It's a sort of a Catholic thing. I, I'm not sure if you heard it, but it's called flagellation. <clears throat> certain Catholic mystics and priests would get like a whip and cut their back and whip themselves uh, to whip themselves into righteousness and suffer and feel like the the, the uh, hurt and pain of Christ. Uh, they whip themselves to beat themselves into submission. They may have sinned or may have done something uh, that they feel let down God and they just whip their back and make blood come out of the back, whipping themselves. Uh, as a form of attaining righteousness, like a religious act to suffer. And in some ways, to let you suffer. In some ways, you're addicted to working to God to make yourself feeling good. And you put yourself through hard things and you work really hard when you could take more time off watching movies and reading books and relaxing and watching the videos. But you really like to work because in some ways you, you think you really have to work to earn the favor of God. And, you know, uh, when you get visited so much by Jesus and you get visited by an angel when you're in the midst of sin and the angel having a conversation with you while you're sinning, um, you start to understand God in a new way that you loved for who you are. And, and it's not based on what you're doing. Uh, so the walking with bare feet uh, not only saved me uh, buying shoes, because uh, you can wear shoes out by walking a lot, uh, but it was a form of self-flagellation that I took upon myself uh, to suffer for Christ's sake. And, um, and so uh, my feet got used to stones and rough, road but you can imagine walking through snow in winter that it was very cold and um, it, it was a form of like really religious self flagellation uh sort of uh a bearing and 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 uh fellowshipping in the sufferings of christ thank you thank you Sadhu. why does it require great effort and patience to recognize god's presence in our life you did mention that in your book, that in order for us to be able to practice the presence of God, it will require a lot of effort and patience from us. Yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, when the presence of God started to come into Matthew's life, uh, he felt it. He, he um, In those days, he was going to work and he, he was a whole lot more organized and each morning he'd have a shower and he, doesn't have a shower every morning these days, but um, in those days he was going to work and uh, he used to get up and have a shower. And by the time he's finished the shower, the presence of God was on him. He's feeling mm -hmm. the peace and the joy of the Lord. And um, he he's never been able to write a book how to manifest the presence or write a video or do a video on how to and manifest the presence and keep the presence of God because he's not got no idea how mm. he got it. Um, he, his best guess is, um, his best guess is he becomes such a good friend of mm. Jesus that the spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, just wanted to hang around him. And, you know, uh, it's the Holy Spirit's way of saying, I'm with you and I want to bless you, and I love hanging around you. Um, if if someone uh, if someone really treated uh, your mother with respect and bought her gifts and gave her a job and treated her like a lady, 
um, and and that was an older man. Uh, you'd like to hang around that man. You'd like to be with him. You'd like to do him favor. You'd like to make him happy. And um, Matthew was making Jesus so happy that the Holy Spirit, uh, the Spirit of God wanted to encamp around him and bring a sense of happiness uh, to him. And so he's never really heard himself explain it that way, but that makes a lot of sense. But takes uh, a lot of obedience and a lot of self-denial, a lot of obeying Jesus uh, to bring the presence of God into your life. And there's certain things uh, like sin and certain things where you can push the presence of God away from yourself. Uh, you can start to watch a crime movie uh, and, and, and violence and, and crime and the presence of God doesn't want to be around that. Uh, there's there's certain uh, music that's like death metal sort of. Uh, Matthew downloaded a person's music the other day because he gets it free on his Apple subscription. And he started to listen to the first song. He had to turn it off because it was bringing darkness into his life. So you can be listening to dark music or watching the wrong sort of film or, or doing something to suppress or uh, decrease the presence in your life. And uh, if you're being led by the Holy Spirit and obeying the Holy Spirit and walking in obedience and uh, doing godly things like praying or reading a Bible or reading a Christian book or listening to worship music, the more you do like something that uh, draws you into closer communion with Christ, the stronger the presence uh, manifests in your life. Uh, the more you study the Word of God, the more the Word of God manifests in your life. The more you read the Word of God, the more presence in your life that manifests. So anything you do, I want to take it away from being religious. There should never be a formula how to manifest the presence of God. And perhaps... That's why Matthew's never written a book on it. Matthew just walks in the presence and walks in a greater level of presence. He walks in the glory of God now and manifests the glory of God with something higher than the presence. Um, but uh, it took a lot of work for me, uh, a lot of obedience for me, uh, a lot of uh, work to steward that. Like It's like keeping a fire you got to tend to a fire. You just can't leave a fire or the fire will go out. You've got to add more logs to the fire and build it up and push the logs around and tend to the fire. And the presence of God is the same thing. It's got to be tended and stewarded and directed and um, encouraged uh, in your life. Thank you. You did talk a lot about intimacy with the Father in your book. Why is it important for us to desire intimacy as Christians? Uh, so intimacy with the Father, or intimacy with Jesus, or intimacy with the Holy Spirit? Intimacy with God. You said intimacy with God. So um, Matthew's come to understand God, and I came to understand God that just as much as I care about every person in India that was sick and not healed, God cares about that. So um, just as I wanted to uh, go into, well, I didn't want to, the churches were abhorrent to me, full of religion, but just as much as the church was full of religion and false teaching, and I'd love to go on a national broadcast and teach all the Christians and rebuke them and uh, teach them the truth and set them free, just as much as, I wanted to set them free in intimacy with the Father. I felt uh, I feel the same thing from the Father that He wants them set free, just like I wanted everyone healed. The Father wants everyone healed, um, and uh, you'll find every uh, spiritual thing of compassion that you have, everything that concerns you as a really spiritual person concerns the father and as you share 
in those concerns and hurts and pains and frustrations and angers and disappointments, as you share in the same feelings of the father and you tap into that and you talk to the father, you become really intimate. You become like him. You become a father yourself that uh, there's a young prophet or a young apostle that you meet that you treat him like the father treats you. You 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 mentor him and you you pass by him every year and you'll sit down for half a day and speak into his life for six hours and allow him to ask you a hundred questions and answer his questions. Matthew's only met two apostles and they had a lot of time for him. One of them answered about a hundred questions of Matthew uh, in a row and just kept on answering questions. At the end of the questions Matthew was asking meanings of scripture verses at the end of uh, answering for hours uh, the apostle said to Matthew do you have less questions now or do you have more questions and Matthew said I have more questions now he said that's why it's important not to go to men for your answers but to go to the Holy Spirit you need to mm -hmm. learn to ask Holy Spirit the questions and he'll answer it. So, um, so you know, young people in the faith uh, want to take your time up and talk to you about their experiences and they want to ask you questions. And when you invest uh, in a son, when you invest in someone and mentor them and uh, disciple them, uh, you, you manifest the love of the Father uh, and the closer you become to the Father, the closer you're aligned in thoughts and emotions with the Father and, and communion with the Father through talking and fellowshipping together, the more you become like him and you can become like an apostolic father to a movement or you can be an overseer of a hundred churches and like a Catholic bishop uh, over certain churches. So the more you hang around God, the more you become like him and the more you hang around the presence of Jesus, the more you become like him and the more you have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, the smarter and wiser and more knowledgeable you become. And so uh, intimacy is not so much, um, well, intimacy in marriage is many times sexual union, but um, men really like that and sometimes women like it. Um, but um, but uh, it's really intimate uh, for a male to walk down the street and be walking with his wife and grab a hand and hold a hand. Sometimes uh, the husband in public putting his arm around her shoulder or holding his hand or stopping her at a set of lights and kissing on the cheek sometimes acts like that from a husband is a whole lot more intimate uh, than sexual union. And uh, so uh, sharing time together, spending time together, touching each other's hearts with conversation and thoughts and discussions and comments, constantly tending that fire, that fire of intimacy. And um, it's really extraordinary to know God on a really deep, deep and intimate level. It's really extraordinary uh, to uh, know Jesus and know how he suffers and understand Jesus. and uh, But it's really sad, this really depressing uh, thoughts, and it can cause a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, uh, to, to realize that if, you know, Matthew's got 121 books so far, and, you know, if... He could just find a way for his books to be read by 10 million people. He'd transform so many Christians' lives. And the, the frustration of having a message based in 120 books, how to be a perfect Christian, how to live a successful, prosperous, abundant, life-giving life, beautiful Christian, You've got the answer in 121 books, but God won't allow you to share that answer with 100 million people. Yeah, some people have videos Matthew's seen 
with 80 million people watching it. Why can't one of these interviews with a saint have 80 million people view it? And then uh, Matthew have, you know, 5 million people subscribe watching every one of his videos. The tension, like knowing it, knowing the truth, knowing how to perfect it, knowing how to fix it, but not being given the opportunity to do that. And, uh, you know, everyone thinks God is all powerful. Well, why can't God broadcast uh, the name Matthew Robert Payne through all the ministries and everyone start coming to Matthew Robert Payne's YouTube? If people hear from God, why can't the Holy Spirit say to, you know, 10,000 or a million ministers, check out Matthew Robert Payne on YouTube and supernaturally have 10 million pastors come to his YouTube channel and then start sharing it with all their friends on Facebook and soon after have 50 million. What, why with God, with all his power, can't he do that? Well, Matthew has to be a hidden. There's a reason for that. God really would love that to happen. And it causes tremendous pain that God can't do it. God gets really upset because he has to work through the free will of mankind and he can't force his own agenda on things. And uh, as you grow closer to God, you share in his frustrations, his anger, his disappointment, his fire, his glory, his vengeance, his wrath. Uh, you, you share in every dimension like God is like a diamond and he's got a hundred facets and a hundred emotions and you learn to flow in those whole hundred emotions and hundred dimensions of him and you know him like in, in many ways and many dimensions. Thank you so much, Sado. I wanted to ask you, when you first of all got converted to Christianity, you had to go and live in a missionary with some Christians but you say you were so shocked to see godless, godlessness among Christians you met in the missionary. Why, why were you shocked? Uh, because, you know, uh, if you believe what the Christians say, they say oh, you need to give your life to Jesus, you need to come to church, and you only have to read the word of God. You only have to have the presence of the Holy Spirit and the leading of the Holy Spirit help you interpret what Jesus preached. And, and every Christian church and every Christian is so far from what Jesus taught, so far from what the apostles taught, um, so into the world, so into possessions, so into the worldliness, so into addictive sin, so into rudeness and, uh, and judgment and pride and self-righteousness and we're better than you sort of attitude. Like you've only been a Christian for six months. We've been Christians for 20 years. Don't think you're telling us what that verse means. We know what that verse means. Your verse is wrong. That's heresy. That's wrong. You're misguided. It, you know, Matthew will walk into a church and start making friends and have a couple of good conversations, come back in a week's time after he's, I've been out to lunch with the Christians two times and think he's got a new friend. Then out of excitement, he'll share a revelation on a scripture that the Holy Spirit said. And when the person hurt, hears it, they recognize that their church for years has been preaching something different. And mm -hmm. how can this obese, self-confessed, mentally ill person on a disability pension be coming out with revelation on a verse that makes their church wrong and mm. acting in error and acting in disobedience. It's easier to reject the fat, obese, mentally ill guy and say he's a fool and avoid him because what he thinks is the Holy Spirit speaking to him is a demon because he's saying that everything their st church stands for and a foundational scripture that uh, their church is modelled on is wrong. 
And the whole denomination of that church uh, built up that verse and models their thing. Matthew, if only been to the church for three weeks, doesn't know that it's one of their core foundation scriptures. And suddenly he comes out with an interpretation of that verse that says the whole denomination of that church is wrong and in error. Well, that happened in Matthew's church, and it's like the people were dear caught in headlights and their eyes went wide and uh, they didn't say to Matthew that's wrong what you're saying is uh, goes against what our church teaches I think you're in error there they just avoid you they just they just walk away from you and so I found uh, as I was reading the scriptures and Christians do this I'd come out excited with revelations and what the Holy Spirit had said and Christians have been Christians for years would tell me I'm wrong, I'm deceived, I'm not hearing from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wouldn't say that because this is what this verse means. And and uh so uh that that they, they were they Christians believed that they're free, and um the verse says, if you abide in my words and my words abide in you well, then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. If you abide in Jesus' words, it means you're obeying his 54 commandments and you're but 50 commandments and you're obeying his 54 parables. That's what abiding in the word means, abiding in my word means. And most Christians, 99% of Christians, don't understand what the parables mean and don't know the 50 commandments. 99% of Christians aren't abiding in the vine and a whole percentage of Christians aren't bearing fruit. It says in John 15 that they're going to be cut off and thrown into the fire, just like uh, the weed and the tares. So there's born-again Christians in churches, weed and tares. The difference between a tear is... The wheat and the tear look exactly the same until it comes time for the fruit to come out. When the fruit comes out, the wheat bears a head and grain and, and the tear stays fruitless. So the tears in the church isn't the non-Christians, isn't the person who hasn't given their life to Jesus or become a Christian. The tears in the church are the people who are not abiding in the teachings of Jesus and therefore not producing fruit uh, for the kingdom. And in John 15, God says there's going to come a time when he cuts those branches off and throws those non-fruit bearing branches into the fire. And uh, sadly, uh, people don't understand what that means. And so uh, because it's never happened before, um, that they don't realize that uh, they get cut off and thrown into the fire at their time of death. Jesus hasn't come and uh, like cut a whole swathe of Christians off and put them in the fire or sent them to hell. They don't see that actually happening. So they don't understand what that verse is. And if you bring that revelation of that verse or in, in fact, any Holy Spirit revelation of a verse that disagrees with a Christian, they'll throw swords through you and tell you you don't know what, and they'll enter into an argument. And all you're doing is joyfully bringing what the Holy Spirit told you, and you thought that it's going to be enlightening, enlightening to them and encouraging to them, and you turn out being in an argument with them. So I couldn't do anything right because my bible said they needed to act differently but they didn't act differently if i picked them up on that and said why is that they think i'm judging them and condemning them uh if if i read the bible i had to make a choice be there separate and be holy just as i'm holy and i had to separate myself from um the christians that were giving a bad example Thank you, Sadhu. Uh, you did say something that we cannot attain spiritual perfection without not going through trials and afflictions. Why can't we attain spiritual perfection without not passing through pain and suffering? There's a verse 
in scripture, Matthew's not aware of it, uh, where it says, when you see him, you'll be like him. Uh, you know, a lot of people believe uh, because of that verse and a misunderstanding of that verse, they believe that uh, when they go to heaven, they'll see Jesus, and because they've seen him, they'll be like him. Uh, you found out uh, from Matthew through the interviews in Mentoring in the Heavenlies that people are constantly being perfected in heaven, people walk in the flesh in heaven, and people um, are constantly being transformed into the likeness of Jesus, but very few people in heaven are actually like Jesus. Well, one of the processes of making something perfect, like a potter, you know, a potter um, puts his hand on the clay and molds the clay, and persecution and suffering and trials actually molds your character. If you have a totally easy life, if everything's working out fine for you, you don't learn things like tragedy and trial and persecution and sufferings teach you. How can you manifest the fruit of the Spirit if you haven't been put under pressure? If everyone you meet loves you, everyone you meet is kind to you, um, how can you exercise patience? If you don't suffer and go through some sort of hardship, how can you rely on the joy of the Lord? How can you manifest joy, uh, learn to manifest the fruit of joy when everything's happy and excited? There's a natural joy. There's a natural love. There's, mm -hmm. there's a natural peacefulness. People in the world can experience joy. People in the world can love. People in the world can feel peaceful. Um, you can play a nice song and people can feel peaceful. So all the fruit of the Spirit can be manifested in non-Christians. But it's only art through persecution and trial and hard times that the Holy Spirit is present for you to manifest those fruits. And uh, like any fruit, when it starts small, but then it gets bigger and bigger and matures and then it's plucked off. And uh, so uh, it's only through persecution and trial that uh, and obedience to God and Jesus' commands that you become like Jesus. John 14, 21 says, if you love me, you'll know my commands. And if you obey my commands, I will love you. My father will love you and I will manifest myself to you. Uh, so uh, if you take that literally, it means if you start to obey the commands of Jesus, you'll see Jesus. That's one of the ways you could interpret that. Well, if you're seeing Jesus all the time, when you see him, you'll be like him. So there's a manifestation and revelation that verse that you can become like Jesus on earth and manifest his character on earth. The second meaning of manifest himself to you, um, manifest myself to you, is manifest my character. You start to understand my character. It's not until you understand my teachings and my heart that you understand my character. But when you actually practice uh, living my character, uh, then uh, you start to understand it. You start to become like me. And like a fire is used, you know, uh, to to get pure uh, gold. Uh, Matthew's heard it said it has to be heated up and boiled seven times. It's got to be boiled, all the impurities scraped off, then cooled and boiled and impurities uh, scraped off and has to it's, there's a scripture that said heated in the fire seven times um, so uh, that fire hurts the gold if the gold if the gold was a living being that would really hurt and and, and so it's through trial and error and persecution uh, that you've developed the character of God and you develop the fruit of the spirit. Thank you, Sado. So is that 
applicable to people in heaven as well? Do they need to go through trials in order for them to continue to develop in the Lord? Uh, there's trials in heaven. Uh, there's uh, struggles in heaven. Uh, many people uh, in heaven are, are hearing uh, as, as we speak uh, that... Uh, that uh, there's things to do and life could be better. And uh, many people uh, heard me say that I share in all the emotions of God and the hundred facets of God, and they're not aware of the hundred different emotions of God and the hundred facets of God because they only see God through uh, their revelation of Scripture and they only see the God that they've met when they've sat with him and talked to him. They only know God through their self-interest and what they want. Uh, they don't see God through understanding what he wants, what he hasn't accomplished, what makes him upset, what makes him sad. Uh, so people are very selfish people. They they see God through their own lens. You know, it's, it's a true fact uh, when people go to heaven, uh, they, they see the throne room through their theology. If their theology mm -hmm. says that uh, the throne room have, has got a sea of glass in front of it, then it's got steps, and then there's 24 elders, so there's 24 thrones, and there's the rainbow. And, you know, they're getting their theology out of what's been seen in the Bible of what Kat Kerr has said, the false prophet, or, or, um, or what other people said. When you open their eyes in vision, and Matthew's been used to do that, when you open their eyes and they enter the throne room, they see what they want to see. They see what they've been told they see. They don't see what's actually there. They see through their theology. The same as prophets prophesy through their theology. If they believe in an angry, judgmental, God that exposes sin and judges people, their prophecies will be like that. If they believe in the loving, airy, fairy, ever forgiving, loving, kind, graceful, patient uh, God, well, their prophecies will be that. Well, the problem with the judgment words is God is graceful and kind and patient and long suffering too. And the problem uh, with the airy, fairy God is God is judgmental, angry, and and full of justice too. So both prophets can bring a true prophecy, but the different dimensions of God's character, and both can be true, but t totally seem opposite to each other. And so you only experience theology and you only experience religion through the understandings and interpretations of the verses and the visions and the experiences and the encounters that you've had. If if you hadn't been forgiven a thousand uh, times when you slept with a prostitute and God restore you uh, to the peace of that, and I didn't, but Matthew has, if if you hadn't been forgiven a thousand times until God drummed it into you, in the midst of sleeping with a prostitute, he loves you. And have saints turn up and actually talk to the naked prostitute and prophesy through you. If, if you haven't seen a God like that, that's not afraid of sin, that's not shy of sin, it's got the whole of heaven watching and a saint speaking through you to a naked girl. If you hadn't experienced that, you would know that there's nothing that turns God off. There's nothing that he can't face. He, he doesn't depart from you when you're sinning. He doesn't take his love away from you. He'll actually, need, he, he'll actually use a prophet to speak to a brokenhearted girl uh, in the midst of the sin. Uh, if the prophet's got the courage to admit that he's, he's pretty good, but his only vice is a, a sexual addiction, and he's honest about that, he can spend the next of hour of the session prophesying and ministering to that girl in the place. Matthew's never knowingly met a prostitute 
outside of her place of work. How could you just sit down and minister to a prostitute? What a unique way to minister to a prostitute is to be in her place of uh, work and minister to, to her in there. And I'm not suggesting men go and hire prostitutes to minister to them because many men don't do it right and, and it's not something God would never lead you to go and sin. But until you've been forgiven that much and loved that much, even in the midst of sin, you know, then you don't understand the grace and forgiveness and long-suffering of God. And when you start to realise that uh, you're important to God and he said some beautiful things to you and encouraged you, and you finally got it out of you to stop striving and stop trying to earn the love of God and stop trying to do things to please God. And you're consistently doing things that upset God. And he keeps on saying he loves you and he's proud of you. And you you stop striving until you stop striving and realize God hasn't turned his love off and he loves you just as much when you don't do anything for two weeks then you won't understand God like I understand God. And uh, God has got a hundred different dimensions to his character. And so many people, so many of you in heaven only see two or three dimensions because you haven't been prepared to let God in. You haven't asked God questions. You haven't discussed uh, the uh, the trafficking on the earth and the sex trade and the way that Apple uh, uses slavery in the workforce and people get paid a dollar an hour to produce things and stay up so many hours that they want to jump off a building and they've got nets on the building to stop people from killing themselves. People are just so frustrated and tired they just want to commit suicide. How could a company... How could a company work to people so hard that they want to choose suicide over keeping on working? And that's your Apple iPhone, guys. Uh, I, I'm not talking to people in heaven anymore. I'm talking to people on earth. Your Apple computer and your Apple iPad and your Apple iPhone, slaves are made to produce it. The batteries are made from people digging up hard rock all day in the hot sun. The batteries are made out of it. The actual products are polished and made and constructed uh, in China through companies that Apple contract to. And it's slavery. It's slave labor. And it's not fun. You know, why not double the price and have Americans in real job getting real hours paying? And you might have to pay $2,500 for your iPhone now not 1500 Well, the world is so full of lust and running after money and keeping up with the Joneses. People would adjust to that, to have their iPhone. And perhaps, you know, perhaps Android is doing the same thing and using slave labor to keep the prices. Perhaps we put all the prices of all the technology up and stop people working away in slavery. But the selfishness of people the selfishness of the West, they want to keep the cost down. They don't want it to cost them. So they willingly, every time they buy an Apple product, they're condoning people in slavery, being worked and worked and worked to a point that they want to suicide. And there's thousands of people digging rocks all day with mothers with their child on their backs, digging rock, back-breaking work, hourly, like, earning nothing, and it's like slavery, really hard work uh, to make the batteries of your Apple products. And it happens all over the place, and and people just don't care. And if if you don't understand that breaks the heart of God, if, if you don't see that from heaven, the people suffering, if you don't understand the suffering, that's the whole dimension of God you just don't understand. Sometimes he wants you to minister. If you, like one third of you in heaven have been sexually molested or sexually abused, maybe he wants you to minister to other people who need healing of that. If, if, if you're coping well, you may 
not a fully recovered, but you've got a like good life and you're in the higher realm in heaven than the lower realm. And you know a lot about God and you know a lot about loving yourself and you know a lot about forgiving your abuser and you've worked through most of your pain. Why don't you push your iPad now if you're sexually abused and say, I want to be a friend of someone who recently comes to heaven who's been sexually abused, who's still dealing with that trauma. If that's you and you'd like to be a friend of someone and help them recover from sexual abuse, press that button on their iPad now and pe people will arrange it and train you to become a therapist and a counsellor for that. Uh, if you're an experienced cook, an experienced chef, there's so many people in heaven want to arrive in heaven and become a cook and become a chef. Instead of our training schools and our trade schools in heaven, are you willing to have an apprentice in your kitchen and hand train them how to cut and how to prepare food? And they can go to school to uh, learn, but are you willing to let an extra chef into your kitchen and personally train them, personally mentor them, and if heaven can match the personality of that person and that person have certain brokenness in your life that you both share, well, heaven knows. Uh, if you want to put someone who you can help emotionally and train them to be a chef, press this button, second button, and, and uh, not only personally train them and apprentice the right sort of person, but help them emotionally and spiritually. And if you're in any trade in heaven and you want an apprentice and you want to train a person and you've suffered in a certain way that uh, you've recovered from, but you want to use your experience and your love and your understanding to help your apprentice, press this button and prophets will match you to a new arrival in heaven that needs you. Now, isn't that, a better thing for you all to do that you can work uh, in your job and train up an apprentice uh, to learn your craft, but also help them spiritually and emotionally. Thank you, Sadhu. You did say it is pointless to seek peace in the things of this world. Why did you say that? Well, um, the... The world, the world is fleeting. Mm. You know, uh, 1 John 2, 15 to 17, and uh, as you edit this, uh, you can uh, put this in the New Living Translation. You can post 1 John 2, 15 to 17 uh, in the text here. And I want to talk about this text. If... If you are in love with the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in you. The things that you see, the things that you can touch, the things that you experience in the world, it's got nothing to do with the love of the Father. It's got nothing to do with the ways of the Father. And if you get pleasure out of your position or you get pleasure out of your possessions, that's not of God. And John said, loving the world won't bring you peace. It won't bring you satisfaction with the Father. Yet whenever you uh, buy something or get a new possession, you're happy about it for a little while, but then it fades off and you need a new rush of adrenaline buying something new. And that's what keeps the capitalistic society going as people are continually buying themselves new things and uh, getting going after that peace, going after that rush of happiness and rush of joy that they actually own a new iPhone. And they'll pay that iPhone off over two years. And, um, and yet if you went four years, between swapping out an iPhone, you could save $1,500 and put uh, two pastors through Heidi Baker's Iris Ministries and uh, totally train two pastors for four years theological training or $1,500 
that you put in Kiva, K-I-V-A dot org, uh, you could uh, 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 help uh, four to 100, uh, 40 for 1,000 and 20. You could help 60 people with a small loan for their business. You, you could you could help 60 people get a business to help them out of poverty or you can get your new iPhone every two years. You can go without it and leave your iPhone to be four years old or you can replace your iPhone every two years. If you replace it every two years, 60 people miss out. If you replace it every four years, you can help 60 people uh, start a small business and get themselves out of poverty. And that's how um, that's how you can uh, compare uh, trying to get peace and joy and happiness out of the world and how you can get joy and peace and happiness out of obeying God. It's how you use your money, how you use your time, how you use your knowledge, how you use your wisdom, how how you use your possessions, how how you use your uh, physical emotion, how, how you use your physical body. There are all ways that you can touch people and change people. Uh, if you want to obey God, you'll be like the birds that God provides for. If you seek first his kingdom and his commands and his teachings, he'll keep you in abundance. He'll keep you happy. He'll manifest your joy and your peace. The presence of God and the joy and peace and living in a glory is an amazing feeling. You know, sometimes the glory comes on Matthew so deep he feels like he's stoned. Um, mm. And uh, all of Satan's drugs are manifestations of what's possible in God, but it's just a darkness's way of making people feel good and so you can run after the things of the world. You can run after what the world offers to bring you peace, but it's fleeting and it doesn't last and it doesn't give you eternal reward and it doesn't give you eternal happiness. When you're loving people and providing for people and blessing people, it'll bring a joy that lasts. When you're loving yourself and blessing yourself and buying things, it'll be a fleeting peace and joy. Did that answer Thank your you. question? Yes, it does. So, Matthew, we've got three questions to go. Yeah. yeah. So you said the essence of prayer does not consist in asking for things, but in opening one's heart to God. What do you mean by, by this? Uh, so before when I was saying, I just uh, have a break. Wait a second. back um do you remember when i said god has a hundred different facets a hundred different emotions and we just shared about running after the world and running after your things doesn't bring lasting peace but sowing your love and your time and compassion and your kindness in the people are things of the kingdom and it'll have everlasting peace Right, so don't you think you'd get more satisfaction out of your relationship with God, fellowship with God, having conversation with God, asking God questions, getting to know God through conversation, so you slowly get to know those hundred facets that make up the ball of God, that many people just see a ball of light on the throne. Imagine getting to know that whole ball of light. 
in intimacy, every facet, sharing in the same emotions. You can go after the things of your world, go after the things of the flesh and things of the world and ask for them, or you can have proper communication with God and come to know him in a hundred different ways, in a hundred different facets. It's your choice. You can go after what you think will make you happy, or you can go after the heart of God. The scripture says God knows what you want even before you ask. Mm -hmm. Scripture says don't make long-winded prayers. Scripture says uh, don't uh, pray rote prayers, the, the same repetitiveness prayer. Uh, so, uh, so many people are praying the wrong way. James uh, says in James 4, you have not because you ask not. Uh, you ask and you don't receive because you want to spend it on your pleasures. So, so many people are asking for things that will make them happy, that they think, temporal things, things that are passing away, things that uh, don't uh, achieve anything like uh, 1 John 2.15 says, but and the world and its, it, its, its things are passing away, but anyone who does uh, the things of God will be loved forever, will, will live forever. And you can quote what the verse actually says there. The eternal things are the things of God. Uh, so uh, learning to have two-way conversation, two-way uh, communion with God rather than uh, coming to God with your shopping list, he already knows. He shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. You don't think he needs your needs? Do you think you're so smart that you've got to tell God what you need? He knows what you need. Why don't you just commune with him and obey him and start to abide in the teachings of Jesus and just say a simple prayer, uh, Father, it was great talking to you. Can you supply all the things I need that you know I need? Mm. And say it with one sentence instead of listing them all off over half an hour with 20 different things. Why can't you just say a short, like a conversation, a half an hour with God, asking him all sorts of questions, having a conversation about your life and his life. At the end of it, say, Father, you know what I need. Please supply those things for me. And I ask in faith, according to uh, your, your uh, love and your promises, uh, grant me the things that I need. Thank you, Salo. Can you share any personal spiritual practices or disciplines that were particularly meaningful to you during your time on heart? Okay, so Psalm 1, uh, Psalm 1 uh, verse 2 talks about, and he who meditates on the Lord day and night, meditates on, on uh, the Lord day and night. That's the most beneficial practice that I practiced on earth. I chewed like a cow, Matthew's heard it described like this, a, chat, a cow picks off grass and chews on it, swallows it. Then later on, after it's processed a little bit in his stomach, he regurgitates that uh, grass that's mixed with the stum stomach acid and he re-chews that grass and swallows it again and keeps on regurgitating that grass to break it down to make milk. A, a cow, if you don't know that, a cow doesn't just eat grass and produce milk. It has to be regurgitated a number of times for it to be broken down so it can be made into milk. The same way you need to go over and go over and go over and go over 5,000 times the same scripture. A problem's in your life, you just quote the scripture at the problem. Problem's in your life, you just quote the scripture. Matthew can't sleep. It's the second night without sleep. He, he's going to start going crazy if he can't get to sleep. I can do all things through Christ. The fear of not being able to get to sleep. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Um, 
Jesus says to him, just talk to me. Stop stressing. And let's have a conversation. And uh, he talks for an hour and falls to sleep. What got him to sleep? Well, he was wired. He was manic. He was high. What got him to sleep? The verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus just kept him talking for another hour until his body came out of fear and just relaxed and was ready to go to sleep. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, can do everything. All things work together for good for those who love God and are called, called according to his purpose. Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commandments. Jesus said that four times in John 14 and John 15. John the Apostle wrote that five times in his letters. In the writings of John, it's written nine times, if you love Jesus, obey him. So if all things are working together for good for you, that's because you don't love God. And how do you love God? You love God by obeying Jesus and abiding in Jesus. So you may have a life where that verse doesn't work. That's because you're not doing that verse. Because you're not loving God. You're not obeying Jesus. Jesus said very clearly, if you love me, obey my commandments. If you don't know his commandments and you're not obeying his commandments, you're not loving Jesus. You know, Jesus said in John 14, 21, if you love me, you'll know my commandments. Uh, if you don't know Jesus' commandments, you don't love him. 1 John uh, 2 verse 3 says, if anyone says, I know him, and doesn't obey his commandments, he is a liar and the truth is not in him. So if you're a Christian and you don't know the 50 commandments of Jesus and you're not obeying him, you not only don't love him, but you don't know him, you're a liar when you say you know Jesus and you have no truth in you. That's what John said. John's the person who says, if you sin, you've never known God, because sin is of the evil one. You, you won't hear preachers preaching on that. I saw the Christians in the villages in, in, in that uh, place I lived, I saw them sinning. I saw that verse of John, a sin is of the evil one. If, 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 if you sin, you don't know him. I was thinking, these, these people don't even know Jesus. So uh, the verse says, uh, if, if you love me, you'll know my commandments. So if you don't know my commandments, Jesus says, you don't love him. And if you obey my commandments, I will love you and my father will love you. So if you're not obeying his commandments, does Jesus really love you? And does the Father really love you? Now, we know positional love, God loves everyone, but there's a sort of love and respect you get for obeying your dad, right? Your dad naturally loves you as a child, but when you're obedient, there's more respect and more love coming from your dad. So there's a greater form of love that you can be loved by Jesus and this greater form of love that the Father can love you if you're obeying Jesus' commandments. If you're not obeying Jesus' commandments and Jesus' parables, then you're not abiding in the vine. And if you don't abide in the vine, you won't bear fruit. And if you don't bear fruit, you'll be cut off and thrown into the fire. And you may think, well, I haven't been thrown into the fire. I must be abiding fruit. But if you don't abide and bear fruit, when you die, you'll go to hell. And so it says, uh, so it says uh, I'll manifest myself to him, to the person obeying my commands. So uh, all things work together for those who love God and, and are called 
according to his purpose. So you not only got to love Jesus, obey Jesus, do everything Jesus taught, abide in Jesus to love God, but you've got to be walking according to his purpose. If if you don't know your purpose, if you don't know why you're here, if you don't know your purpose in Christ, if you haven't read uh, uh, Matthew's book, Finding Your Purpose in Christ, if you're one of the 20% of Christians who know what you're meant to be doing, you may be walking in God's purpose, but if you're part of the 80% of Christians who don't know what their purpose is, you're not only not loving God but not obeying Jesus, but you're not walking according to his purpose. So how can that verse work for you? How can all things work together for good if you're not doing the two qualifications, obeying Jesus and walking in your purpose? So people, people look at scripture and say that's not true, that doesn't work. But if you abide in scripture and meditate in scripture, you'll find the meaning uh, in the hundredth time you meditate that scripture, the the Holy Spirit will bring revelation. Well, the reason it's not working for you, Matthew, is you're not obeying Jesus. To love Jesus, remember what John says, you, you've got to obey him. You need to obey him. And uh, as you meditate on scripture, as you quote the scripture more and more, you get more revelation and more revelation on the scripture. The more revelation, the deeper that scripture goes, the more you can build on, the more you can walk on, the more you can manifest. And uh, so there's a lot of Christians. There's a thousand and one Christians, if, if they're actually watching this video, if 10,000 Christians watch this video, it might get 500 comments with arguments, scriptures mm. quoting all sorts of uh, errors and saying that's not true, that's not true. There's a thousand and one different Christians that can walk scripture. There, there, isn't any, there isn't any Christian on earth that could walk scripture like I can. Mm. So, you know, and and you will... And he that abides in my word will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Um, if you understand the teachings of Jesus and you understand what the New Testament teachings and commands are, if you walk in that word, if you abide in that word, it'll set you free. But the problem is, Christians are fighting over meanings of scripture, but if you abide and you meditate on scripture, the Holy Spirit will give you the meaning of the scripture. When you know the meaning of, uh, you know, they'll come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, we did this and did this and said, depart from me. I never knew you. Matthew didn't know who those person were, were 15, for 15 years. The Holy Spirit wouldn't tell him. He couldn't find it. He asked heaps of people, what does that mean? How could Christians be going to hell? They're not Christians. Once saved, always saved. No Christian can go to hell. He didn't agree. He didn't agree for years. And finally, when we revealed it to it, then he worked out what sort of Christian, someone teaching the prosperity doctrine, someone teaching once saved, always saved, um, then uh, then when he worked it out, it made sense to him. Now no one, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter who they are or where they come from. When Matthew got revelation of what that scripture means, no one can tell him he's wrong. He doesn't need to enter into an argument with someone and debate it with someone. You only have to debate when you have to prove yourself right when you have to have a feeling that you're right. If someone wants to argue with Matthew, he's got no time for it and he doesn't have to spend time arguing it or trying to prove it because he knows it. 
So many people talk to Matthew about verses in the Bible. Matthew's been walking on that verse for 20 years. He knows what that verse means. It's manifested himself multiple times in his life, and he stood on it. Like Peter walked on the word of Jesus. Jesus said, come, and Peter walked on that word. He walked on the prophecy, come, and he did what Jesus said, and you know, uh, Proverbs 4, 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all of your spirit. Lean not on what your mind says to you. In all of your ways, acknowledge God and obey what the Spirit's saying, and he will set your path straight. You, you know the scripture is um, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. That's where your spirit lies. Lean not on your own understanding. That's what your mind says. In all of your ways, acknowledge God. That's not praising God. That's not singing God's praises. That's obeying God and doing what he says. You're acknowledging God. You're telling me to do this. I acknowledge you. I'm going to do this. And he'll set your path straight. So many people are trying to set their own path straight. So many people are trying to live the way their paths are taught. But scripture says a man will make plans, but God will make the final move. A man's ways will lead him astray. There's scriptures, Matthew can't remember what they say, but a man's ways are wrong and God will always direct the path. Yeah, let my word be a light unto your feet and a lamp unto your path. How can how can the word light your feet and be a lamp unto your path if you don't understand the word? If you don't understand what the word is saying, if you haven't got rhema, Holy Spirit revelation on the word of God, how can the word direct you? How, how can you stand on the word of God when your interpretation of the word of God is error? Why is the church in bondage to the world? Why does the church bow to Baal? All these churches that have got, uh, you know, official... Uh, C3 exemptions on their tax. They, they sign their, their ministry and church over to the government. They're serving Baal. They want a tax exemption. Right? Why do they need a tax exemption when God is their supply? So they choose to do things God's way to get a tax exemption. They choose to sign their church over to the government. They choose man's ways, but you're meant to trust in the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so the best thing to answer your question, uh, the best uh, thing that I participated in uh, is uh, is uh, meditating on the word of God. Thank you so much. Matthew, I'm going to stop at this question because of time. I know you've got something to do with now. Thank you. We've got 10 minutes to go, if you like. you got 10 minutes to go. Yeah. Okay. Because I was conscious of time. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So, is this, my... is this question 30? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, how did your experiences of persecution and hardship shape your understanding of faith and discipleship? So, I want to share this with you. Uh, I share a lot of stuff out of Matthew's life to make illustration. Matthew uh, uh, bought a book on faith one time. It had uh, 14 stories of great people of faith, and they're explaining what faith is and how they developed the faith. The first seven authors in that, the first seven writers in that book, it was interesting, it was seven, and it was half of the 14 writers, but the first seven consecutively said, if it wasn't for the trials that I had in my life, I wouldn't have the strong faith that I have. It's like the potter with the wheel. He gets his hands in the clay. If it doesn't form well, he flattens it all out and starts again. Those hands where he horns and forms the clay and makes a hole in it, that hurts. If 
if someone was doing that to you, that would be like sandpaper on your hands, right? And 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 like sandpaper, like sanding wood, that hurts the wood. If the the wood is alive, that hurts the wood, but it gets it smooth and it needs sanding. So our lives to be perfected have got to be perfected in suffering. Jesus wasn't perfected on the cross. Jesus was perfected with his suffering. All the people he couldn't heal, all the people he couldn't teach, all the people that were in bondage to religion that he couldn't touch, all the loneliness that he felt with no one understanding, all the wisdom that he possessed, that uh, if he could only just be the Messiah and take over the world and the fact that he can't do that, the understanding that he's got to suffer this horrific death in 15 years. All of these things made him suffer. And it's through his suffering and trial and his grief that perfected him. People... People think that Jesus' suffering for six hours on Friday was amazing. Matthew asked uh, Jesus one time, uh, Jesus asked Matthew one time, do you know why Christians always say at prayer meetings, thank you for your cross? Jesus, I thank you for the cross. And why is it in so many songs, Jesus, we thank you for the cross? Do you know why Christians pray those prayers and sing those songs? And Matthew said to him, I have a feeling I don't want to know. Jesus said, come on. Why do they always, why is the favourite thing you can say in a prayer meeting is Jesus, I thank you for the cross. I, I didn't deserve that. I thank you so much for dying for me. Why do you know when you say that at a prayer meeting, everyone says the amen and comes and, pass you on the back and say you pray such beautiful prayers. Why 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 is that the sentence that gets the most praise and all the amens? Jesus, once again, I I don't think I want to know the answer to that question. So please don't tell me. Jesus responded, Matthew, you're my friend. I want you to understand. Please let me tell you. Matthew had pushed back two times as the prayer that he'd prayed to get the amens. It's something he didn't want to, he, he sensed in his spirit, he didn't want to understand that reason. He sensed that it didn't impress Jesus when people were saying, thank you for the cross. He sensed the way Jesus was saying it, it wasn't going to, be an answer he could come back from. It was going to be a revelation that he didn't want to hear, and he pushed back, and you can do that with a friend, but most people can't do it with Jesus because Jesus isn't their friend. But Matthew pushed back twice saying, I don't want to hear it. Jesus said, you're my friend. If the friends of people obeying Jesus. The disciples obeyed Jesus for three years. And then Jesus said, now you're my friends, and I'll tell you what the Father says. But they'd been disciples until that and learned to obey Jesus. Most, most Christians, if they're not obeying his parables and his commandments, they're not Jesus' friend. So when Jesus said, I'm your friend, I want to tell you, Matthew said, okay. Exasperated, ex exasperated, he said, okay. Everyone says thank you for the cross because I told them to take up their own cross daily and they refused to do it. So they thank me for mine. So every one of you who has said that, you're saying that because you refuse to obey the Holy Spirit 
and you refuse to let the Holy Spirit direct your day, and you refuse to obey Jesus' words, and you refuse to obey what Jesus taught, and you refuse to abide in Jesus, and you refuse to be part of the vine, and you refuse to walk the narrow gate, and you refuse to walk the difficult path. You're thanking Jesus for something was just a walk in the park for him. Six days, one Friday. That suffering's over, people. You know, if I could cuss at you right now, I'd say such and such, such and such, give up with the thanking Jesus for his cross. It was over 2,000 years ago. There's people in front of you on every street in your city that need your love. Stop thanking Jesus and start obeying him. These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You're not even obeying me. You're not even abiding in my vine. You're not even abiding in my thing. Matthew asked one time, why don't Christians, he asked the father one time, why don't Christians buy a book on what do the commands mean and what do the parables mean? Why can't they educate themselves and learn how to be a proper Christian? Why don't they do that? I've got two books. Why aren't people buying my books? And uh, God said to them, it's because they don't want to know. Because they know if they know, they've got to do it, and they don't want to do it, so they keep their head in the sand. And they just play religion. They just do what religion tells them to do. So they're a goody-goody Christian. And so... Jesus hasn't got many friends, so um, the the way to uh, the the way the these uh, seven authors said they grew in their faith was through the suffering and the trials, and you know uh, your insurance is only good when you can cash it in, right? You can have an insurance policy for two million dollars. But when the accident happens or the tragedy happens, your insurance policy is only good when you get the $2 million. Insurance companies find all sorts of causes and reasons why not to pay out. They're in the business of not paying out, but they're in the business of taking your money, but they're not in the business of paying out. Scripture is only true when it pays you a dividend. If if you can't get scripture to pay a dividend, it's not true. And most people are walking around with uh, understandings of scriptures and revelations of scriptures that are untrue. And they're sad and depressed. You only develop the fruit and the character of Jesus when you suffer like him, when you go through tragedy like him. When you allow someone to put sandpaper to you and sand off your flesh. Matthew was invited by his father to come out to a farm one day and do some work. And uh, he wasn't paid for it, but he, his father wanted him to do it. And they were pruning uh, fruit, fruit trees. Uh, they, were, um, they were plum trees. And there was all little buds, uh, like little uh, one centimetre buds on the tree and there was heaps of them. And you had to take about 18 of the 20 buds off. You had to take them all off the tree because they were all fruit growing. But if you left them all on there, the, the, like, the, fruit, the fruits would all come out. There'd be a lot of fruits, but they'd only be one centimetre, two centimetres big, and they need to be four centimetres round. And so you had to take off, 80% of the fruit, and that's called pruning. Well, trees are alive, they're spiritual. You can talk back and forth to a tree, and Matthew's done that a number of times. They're spiritual, they're alive. That hurts the tree. You know, Jesus said, uh, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me will bear much fruit. He that bears much fruit, I will prune so that he bears much more fruit. Well, Matthew was taking that 80% of the fruit off. He was pruning that tree. It was hurting the tree. So in order to produce fruit, 
God's got to prune you and to produce more and more fruit, he's got to prune you more and more. So the better you are, the more you suffer. And the better you get, the more you suffer. And the more you suffer, the better you get. But the converse is, if you're a tear in a church and you're not producing fruit, then when you die, you're going to be cut off and thrown into the fire. So there's a lot of tears in the church. There's a lot of people who aren't obeying Jesus' commands in, in the church. There's a lot of people who aren't abiding in the vine in the church. There's a lot of people not producing spiritual fruit. And it's not the, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. That's not fruit. Fruit is when someone needs $200 and you give them $200. Fruit is when someone brokenhearted comes into your church and is lonely and you sit down and talk to them for an hour. Fruit is giving a brokenhearted person a hug. Fruit is taking a single mother out shopping for, for clothes, new clothes for her children. Clothes always get neglected. You know, when a mother's got an alcoholic father or gambling father, uh, she's always, you know, husband, she, she's always buying food and trying to keep food in the table, but the, the kids get hand-me-downs or second-hand clothes. They never get nice clothes or expensive clothes. You can take her out and, and buy her all these things. So um, I, Jesus taught uh, very clearly that, uh, the way to produce more fruit, well, the reward you get for producing fruit is God's going to hurt you even more. So if you're constantly suffering, it's because you've got the potter and he's carving you into a precious vehicle, a precious uh, possession. And, um, you know, uh, it says in the prophets what, what, what clay speaks to the potter and tells him what he wants to do. But when is the clay's position to tell the potter what to do? And so many Christians are ordering Jesus around and ordering God around and telling God what they want to do with their life and God what they want to achieve and asking for all these things. When God knows the purpose for your life, God knows what... He wants you to do with your life. And he wants you to direct you to that life. And he wants you to sustain the pain and the suffering that you need to go through to be perfected into his image. Thank you so much. That's my last question. That, what you've just said now, like the more you do for God, the more God takes you through suffering so as to perfect you. That's really new to me and it's good to know. And I, you've really, really blessed my heart with a lot of the messages I, that you I, I actually don't need to, uh, Matthew doesn't need to speak to the person uh, to 10 p.m., which is like two hours from here. So so uh, okay. let's take some time uh, for you to speak and you uh, uh, give, you know, the people in the book, people listening to this video, some reflection on uh, not only what you just heard then, but some reflection on some of the things I said there. So look over the questions and try and uh, give some feedback on some of my answers. Uh, oh, I you know, said it. You already I've... said it. Yeah, you said a lot of things today. And there's so many things that are new to me. But at the same time, I knew that with your, with your work, on heart and which reading your book that you were someone that was really really close to god and really close to jesus and obviously you work closely with the holy spirit as well so we, a lot of the answers you've given today they're really deep and broad and wide so i need to go back into the messages to listen to them over and over again because I know you've been able to provide responses as well from the richness of Matthew, because Matthew has got so many experiences as well of working with the father. So, but I think what touches my heart mostly is what you've just said now in terms of suffering. Suffering is a way of God perfecting you to get you to where you need to be. 
And the more you place the father, the more you, you go through the suffering. I wouldn't have think of it in that way, but the way you've been able to express it has brought so much joy to me that whenever you're experiencing challenges in life, you need to embrace it and take it with gladness. And that really helps me as well to understand your approach because every time I read your book, when you go through a lot of pain, suffering, you were always joyous to share in the sovereign of the Lord. And I think this is what every Christian needs to know. And we need to embrace it that suffering should not be something we should dodge away from, but it should be something that we should embrace. And you did say something as well that I do I do suffer a lot because I tend to overwork myself and I tend to think that I need to do more for God, for God to love me. But God already loves me, which I know that a lot of the saints have reiterated several times that I'm loved by God, that I don't need to think I need to do more to show. But maybe I just enjoy working as well, as much as you, I'm, you need, I'm... You need more scripture and you need more conversations with God and you need more prophecies uh, for God to speak through a prophet to tell you what he feels. Matthew heard a uh, hundred prophecies. A hundred prophecies mm. says, I love you. And 80 of the prophecies said, I'm proud of you. And even with those 80 prophecies saying, I'm proud of you, Matthew couldn't receive, I was proud of you. And even Jesus saying it 80 times, he couldn't receive it. So it doesn't matter that it was said. If you can't receive it, it's not having its effect. Jesus said, I'm proud of you. In the midst of Matthew's pornography and prostitute addiction, Jesus kept on saying, I love you. I'm proud of you. And it just theologically, it didn't make sense to Matthew that Jesus was proud of him in the midst of his addiction. And he went to this dirty massage place one time where where a girl gives you a massage and then sexually gives you hand relief. And he he walked out of there and he was uh, feeling guilty. And you have to learn, like, when you're stuck in sin, you need to process the guilt really fast to get back into the presence and back into forgiveness. You can walk two, two days in guilt and shame, but it cuts off the presence. So you have to be able to confess your sin and, forgive yourself and he walked down the street which took about two minutes to walk down the street and he went past like a six-year-old Chinese girl and he said in his spirit that girl is just so innocent and Jesus responded to him just like you right and uh and uh that that meant more to him than the 80 times uh, Jesus said, I'm proud of you. Because Matthew is attracted to young girls, not sexually, but to their innocence. The childlike, like Michael Jackson was uh, loving young children. Matthew looked at her contrasting himself, seeing that little girl is the future massage therapist that he's just abused and thinking, you know, I'm just abusing a little girl like that that's grown up. Matthew said to himself, she's so innocent. Jesus responded straight away to him, just like you. When you've had revelation, rhema revelation of God like that, in the midst of your sin in the midst of just after being a sinner and abusing a girl, for Jesus to say you're innocent. Matthew was still in shame. He hadn't said sorry. He hadn't confessed uh, to Christ. He, he, he hadn't been forgiven. And yet Jesus still in his sin nature, still three minutes after he He'd been in the place of uh, sin. Jesus was saying he's innocent. And so through revelation, through visions, through prophecies, through theology, through the Bible, 
you've got to be get convinced somehow that God loves you no matter what. God's in love with you. He loves every part of you. You you could stop doing these videos and and start to read books and start to do podcast reviews on Christian books and start a ministry of uh, giving really detailed uh, reviews, 40 or 50 minute reviews on books saying why here's 10 points why you need to read this book. And you could make a, a whole ministry of doing that and really just enjoying yourself. Uh, you don't have to work. There's nothing you need to do uh, to earn Jesus' love anymore. And until you get a full revelation of that, you'll be striving. And, and you know, even though you're being led by the Spirit and there's no doubt uh, but the people that uh, see the interviews know that not only were you led by the Holy Spirit to get the questions or Matthew's angel, Bethany, um, not only are you led, to do your research and ask really good questions and you're led in the midst of the interview asking other questions that are led by the Holy Spirit. Not only are you led by the Holy Spirit so well, the fact that you think you have to work is is flesh, it's striving, it's religion. And um, be patient with yourself. Uh, we're, we're trying to focus our message and from time to time, giving you messages and messages to build that theology, to build that understanding, to give you revelation that you're absolutely beautiful. You don't, you don't actually believe that you're beautiful. You don't believe that you're a princess. You, you don't uh, believe that you're royalty. You, you don't believe that you're going to sit on a throne. You don't understand that you're going to rule cities. You, you don't understand that you, you're going to be promoted to a high place, you know, uh, Benjamin's going to be in, in a position that uh, he's in a leadership position in heaven, but uh, he's going to have a wife that totally changed heaven, totally radically changed heaven from the heaven he arrived in to the heaven he'll be in when you finish your work. You know, it won't be you looking up uh, to Benjamin, it'll be Benjamin being so proud that he's able to be your husband. And you don't know that yet. You don't know your future. You, you're like Mary Magdalene thinking that uh, you need to kiss the feet of Jesus. And uh, we were actually sharing that the other day. And you thought uh, in yourself that um, it would, would have been really interesting to uh put ointment on Jesus' feet and kiss him and embrace him like that. And uh, you don't know that um, that anything that's not done of faith is sin and that that uh, in, in an effort to please God, you're sinning because you're striving in the flesh. And uh, God, God doesn't not forgive you for that and he understands that. But I shared this uh, with you to say that even though Matthew was uh, told 80 times by pro prophecy that we're proud of him, he didn't understand that we're proud of him. It didn't really break open until he saw that young girl and we said to him, you're innocent. And he got a revelation that we love him just in, in the middle of his sin. And we had saints turning up and talking to the prostitutes and talking to him and giving him directions on what to say and how to treat the prostitute in the midst of his sin. The saints walking around in, in with the prostitute naked and uh, Princess Diana said to one of the girls when she was having a shower, Princess Diana was talking to her in the massage. And when she was in the shower, Princess Diana said, um, Princess Diana wants to say something to you. And the girl said, what? She said, I, w I wish I had breasts your size when I was on earth. You've got beautiful breasts. And um, that really touched when saints talk, it really touches and it touches really deep. And the girl, the next time he visited, commented on that. I said, 
I told you the week before that you got really good breath. She said, you're not prince. She smiled. She said, but you're not Princess Diana. And so she fully believed it was Princess Diana. And uh, so you can minister in the midst of sin. It's not until we have saints and angels and God and Matthew's mother speaking to him in the midst of the sin, watching the sin, engaging in the sin, engaging in uh, things for Matthew to do in when he's with the girls, that he come to realize that God doesn't depart from people when they're sinning. He leans in closer. And if people were only open to him, uh, they'd get commentary or ways to uh, make the sin better or, or depart from the sin or get some revelation about the sin that'll break them out of it. Uh, so um, I hope uh, that touched you. Um, and uh, we'll yeah. talk more. Um, but um, perhaps... Uh, as you read this in the transcript, perhaps you might want to, uh, after I say a few things, you may want to go through the transcript and say to lose uh, feedback and give a little paragraph after I say each thing and give each answer uh, for you to give feedback and uh, confirm that that's right and that touched you and that moved you. Perhaps uh, that's a way you can be transparent, add to the book. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks so for your if, time. If, if you watched all this, uh, please uh, do me a favor and press thumbs up and like this video, and that'll help other people see it. Uh, if uh, I said anything that uh, you disagree with, or I said some things that you liked, uh, please uh, comment and uh, write a comment and every comment helps the video become more popular and if you press like it helps the video become more popular and uh, if this is the first interview you see uh, please be aware that this is one video out of 97 videos in a playlist called mentoring in the heavenlies and uh, we interview a lot of saints in there so there may be quite a few interviews that you'd like to see uh, if uh, you you like uh, Matthew, if you liked uh, this video and you've never seen Matthew before, maybe perhaps you could consider subscribing and uh, watching your notifications and picking a video that you like in the future. God bless you and keep you.